Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you that you know our name and we know yours. And there is no other name given under heaven by which we would be saved and by which we have life and have it to the full. So as we come to your word now, help, help us to open our minds and hearts to receive the truth you want to put in our lives that we might live for the sake of your name. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, it's good to be back. Excuse me while I grab the magic board. It's good to be back. I've been, um, somebody asked me if I still worked here a few weeks ago. <laughs> yes. My wife and I and a number of us were on a trip to Greece and Turkey visiting the seven churches of Revelation. Amazing experience to see the history of the church past and its future as well. We support some church planters in Istanbul and, and got to encourage them as well. That was an incredible trip. And then uh, family wedding and then the family vacation. And so here I am. I'm back and excited to be back. Uh, with all of you. Um, before we jump into the sermon, I just want to talk to you about our Cure Project. Perhaps you've been around. If you're new and visiting with us, we're glad you're here. We periodically talk about partners of ours. We call them Serve the World Partners, local and global partners, that want to pray for, tell you their story, and encourage you to give financially toward if God gives you uh, the means and the opportunity, because we can do more together than we can apart. This partner is called Cure. Uh, our, our VBS students, v VBS kids, um, for over three weeks, have uh, different different weeks throughout the summer, raised almost $12,000 toward our goal of $150,000. I'm thrilled to tell you that our goal, we're already at $110,000, so I want to encourage you. Uh, I, I knew that we would hit the goal because we, we are an affluent community and, you're, and we have generous people. That's really not the point. I mean, it's part of the point, but more to the point is for you. Maybe you grew up in a church where giving was always talked about as, in terms of guilt and obligation, and you're supposed to do this. We really don't wanna talk about giving that way. Giving is an opportunity for us to participate in what God is doing, to honor him with what he's already given us, it belongs to him anyway, and to join what he's doing collectively together as God's people. And so I wanna encourage you, perhaps you've never taken that step of generosity, this is the perfect opportunity. Part of what we're raising money for is to pay the salary of a cure physician. Cure is putting first world hospitals in parts of the world that don't have these resources, things we take for granted. My wife and I had a chance to visit Cure Zambia, the very hospital we're uh, raising money to support. And we met this man named Dr. Jimmy. You'll see an Im image of him, that's the back of my fat head, and Dr. Jimmy's face there. He's operating on a little girl named Catherine. Dr. Jimmy was one of the top orthopedic surgeons for children in the UK. And he gave that up to go work in Zambia and Malawi for five years, for peanuts compared to what he was making. And I asked him why we got to know him. And he said, because there are a hundred men and women just like me, trained, highly trained and skilled that will replace me here. But there I'm irreplaceable. I can do things that are miraculous for them. God, through God, the gifts he's given me and the skills and my education, they don't have these things. And he's part of it. The Cure Zambia is a training hospital. He's training other Zambian doctors to do the same thing. So we're raising money to pay a salary for a physician like Dr. Jimmy for a year. So that we, the, the impact is exponential. Here's an image of a little girl that he operated on, her name is Catherine. She had two club feet and the operation, something that doctors in our country diagnose quick, do the surgery, and you hardly even notice. But there it's like a curse on their life if they can't walk straight. And so it was just amazing to meet her and her mom and many children like her. I wanna encourage you, uh, when you give, all of the money to serve the world goes to support this CURE project and above and beyond the 150,000 that we're gonna raise, uh, goes to support other Serve the World partners just like them. So again, thank you for your generosity. Uh, it's making an impact beyond what you know in places like Cure. Okay, book of Proverbs, you ready? God's wisdom. Uh, I was here last week and, and Pastor Joe preached on, uh, I sat like a regular uh, person out in the, <laughs> not that I'm, I'm irregular up here, but out there, yeah, <laughs> with my wife and son, and we just listened to the, a wonderful sermon from Pastor Joe Scavato on wisdom and family. And it occurred to me, we have to keep reiterating something about wisdom in Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is not a sequential or topically organized uh, book of wisdom. There's, it's, you're cycling through God's wisdom on all these topics and trying to apply them to our lives. And if we're not careful, you can read them and make the mistake of thinking, oh, these are formulas or these are promises, that if I do X, Y will always happen. That's not the case. I sat right in the middle back there and I looked to my left and I saw a family that has been through hell and back with their children sitting all together. And that's been years since that happened. And I thought, what a, what a miracle. That doesn't mean it's all perfect, but I thought there's a, 
There's a miraculous moment there. I looked to my right, I saw another family that I know who are, or are in the midst of it. Both godly families, both parents trying to do their best to apply God's wisdom. The point is this, wisdom, Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs doesn't mean if you always do what this says, everything will work out right. We know that's not true. What it means is, these are God's divine principles given to us for the best way to live, even if it doesn't always work out right. It's the best way for us to live. That's what we're after here. This summer, we've been looking at how to apply God's wisdom to each area of our lives. Today, we come to wisdom and work. God's wisdom applied to our work life. Now, I say work, and you probably think career, job, paycheck, salary, whatever. God's wisdom applied to work has much, so much, so much bigger than your job or your career. We have a complicated and often dysfunctional relationship with work in our culture. Workaholism is rampant, and in the post-COVID world, people who want to sort of have the, the gig economy work from home and, and people not working, 98 million people of the, of the eligible workforce in America are not working. I mean, those who could work but choose not to for various reasons. So it's like we have these extremes. Work is either an idol, my identity, my everything, or some necessary evil that I put up with or try to get out of if I can, which is how I viewed it when I was younger, I think, as well. So what do we mean when we talk about work? Let me give you a working definition of work. Work is the act of investing your time, skills, abilities, and energy wherever God has placed you for the good of others and for his glory. Certainly that applies to your job, your nine to five, your career, but it also applies to much, much more than that. Using who you are, your aptitudes, skills, capacities, energies, for the good of others and for God's glory. Now that's a very different definition than you find in our culture, isn't it? When someone says, I have to work today, or I'm going to work, or when I get off work, what are they talking about? When you say, I'm going to work tomorrow and I start early, are you saying, I'm good. tomorrow at 7.30, I use my time, skills, energy, passions, and, and abilities for the glory of God and the good of others? No, you say, I, I got a meeting. I got to get through my, the events of my day. God designed you for something more than that. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about work, what it is and why it matters and how it should be done. The broad book of Proverbs is telling us as a whole that if you want to live a fulfilled life on earth, you should do three things related to work. And I'll put these up here on the screen. We'll talk through them. First, love your work. You might think, whoa, that's a problem right there, number one. Do your work well and redeem your work. We'll walk through these and be a lot of different passages from Proverbs here. First, love your work. What does that mean? Okay, Proverbs 10, verses four through five. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Now, again, that little phrase, don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean, that's not a promise. That's not a a universal formula. That doesn't mean every poor person you meet is lazy and every rich person is diligent and honest. We know that's not true. That'd be a terrible application of the proverb. It's giving you a principle by which to live. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. The phrase slack hand is interesting. It, 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 the word slack is often used of a bowstring that wasn't strung tightly. So it doesn't, it's not that the bow won't shoot arrows, it's that the arrows are shot weakly and off target. And the, the, the implication seems to be, with the use of that Hebrew word, that the, the, Solomon is saying the, uh, the slack hand is someone who doesn't do their work efficiently, properly, in the right season, on time. And in Scripture, even the most menial and lowly tasks have value and dignity and honor before the Lord. My first job, one of my first jobs, was uh, working for the Crystal Lake Park District. Well, I grew up in Crystal Lake, Illinois, north of here, and, I, and my job was at Main Beach, Crystal Lake, and I was to clean the bathrooms. They called me the Colonel of the Urinals. <laughs> the older guys on, my, on, on the crew. That was my job. I didn't like that job very much. I can tell you, at 16 years old, or however old I was, I did not think... I'm using my time, skills, gifts, talents, and abilities for the good of others, clean this urinal, and for the glory of God. I just wanted to get that job over with. The, the idea that even lowly work can be done with dignity and honor before God, that stands in stark contrast in our culture and, frankly, throughout history. 
certainly in the pagan views of, of the ancient world. Work had, the, less, the higher you were in the social status, the less work you were to do. People worked for you. Uh, you know the, the Greek myth of Pandora's box, right? What the, 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 she has this box, and in it are, are, uh, it's, it's locked, and she's told by the gods, don't open the box, and when she opens the box, what happens? All the evils and miseries in human, human life come out. War, injustice, poverty, disease, and work. Labor, toil comes out of the box. That's how it was viewed. Oh, now we have to work. Or, or the Enuma Elish, the, the ancient Babylonian creation epic, which I'm sure you've all read this summer. <laughs> In the epic, right, Marduk, the chief of the gods, they create the world, and they realize, hey, this whole creation takes a lot of work. And we don't really want to do the work, so I'm going to create a lower creature called humans to take care of creation so that we, the gods, can rest and play. These views were, were pervasive in the culture in which the Bible was written. Work is for the low. The higher you are, the less you should do because people do it for you. It was a misery. It was a suffering. It was an evil. The Bible stands in stark contrast to that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. God shows up in Genesis as a gardener. He gets his hands dirty. He's working. He's making things. And he makes us in his image. And we also work in the creation that he has created. And us as part of it. Work is woven into paradise. Work is in the created order before sin ever enters the picture. Work changes once sin comes, but work is not the result of sin or part of the curse. It's part of how we're made. God shows up as a gardener in Genesis 1 and in, in Matthew 1 and John 1 and Luke 1 and Mark 1. He shows up as a carpenter. We serve a God who's not afraid to get his hands dirty, who works. Work is God's gift to us. And again, using the definition of your gifts, your talents, your abilities, for the good of others and the glory of God. That's a gift that he's given us to participate in the work that is needed. Timothy Keller has passed away and is with Jesus right now doing whatever work God's given him to do in heaven. But he wrote this in a book called Every Good Endeavor, which is a great theological treatise on what work really is. In short, work, and lots of it, is an indispensable component in a meaningful human life. It is a supreme gift from God and one of the main things that gives our lives purpose, but it must play its proper role, subservient to God. I Meaning work, work is a gift from God. It is a terrible God to make your work your God. So if you're not working at all, using your gifts, talents, abilities, capacities, and energies for the good of others and the glory of God, you're living a less than optimal life. There's gonna be an atrophy to your soul. That's not how God made you. Psalm 90, verse 17, puts it this way. The psalmist writes, Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. How? And establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Let me give you two key motives in loving your work, and then we'll move on. These won't be on the screen, but you can jot them down. Love your work as a response to the needs of others. In Proverbs 10, verse 5, a minute ago, we saw that failure brings shame to do your work. Meaning, when you are unwilling to use your gifts, talents, and abilities, and capacities, and energies for the good of others and glory of God, not only you lose, but also the community, the society, the people around you lose. You should do your work and choose your work more for how it benefits the community and it glorifies God than for how much you make or how it advances your career. What are the two primary questions you think people ask today about their work or their job? What are the two major questions? Where and what? And maybe how much, right? <laughs> like, where, where am I going to work? What am I going to do? We ask that question, what do you do? Next time somebody asks you that, say, oh, I pray a lot. I read my Bible. I love my wife. I, I go to, you know... What do you mean, what do you do? As if that's all you are. That's how we think about it. What am I going to do and where am I going to do it? 
those are not wrong questions to ask, but when we apply the wisdom of Proverbs to our work life, those aren't the first questions. The first questions are, how and why? Why are you working at all? For who? And how do you work? Whatever the job is, whether you're the colonel of the urinals or the CEO of the company, doing your work for the glory of God and the good of others, whatever he gives you to do. Second, as a response to God's calling. Your talents, your gifts, your abilities, your energies are not there by accident. They're signposts into how God made you. Now, that doesn't mean there's only one job you could do to please God. Sometimes we make this mistake. People will say things like, well, this isn't my dream job. Well, yeah, welcome to life, right? (laughs) There's parts of our jobs that are hard. Your work isn't primarily about you. Now, that cuts right against the American ethos, doesn't it? Your work is not about you. It's about the good of others and the glory of God. Okay, so second, first, love your work. Second, do your work well. Do your work well. Now, throughout the book of Proverbs, we get uh, one of the teaching instruments Solomon uses is these characters that contrast. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Sterling talked to us about the wise or the prudent and the foolish. Do you remember this? The fool uh, and the prudent person. When it comes to work, we get another character. Some of you might know his or his, well, we'll say it's him, his or his name. You know him? The sluggard. There are some words in English that are fun to say, and I think that's one of them. The sluggard. Okay, let me, just for fun, I'm going to draw the sluggard because it's been a while. In case you don't know what the sluggard is, let me just show you. There we go. Okay. Uh, you have to. The sluggard has droopy eyes, of course. The sluggard is constantly referred to in the book of Proverbs as like this character who we don't want to be like. The sluggard has his chair. The sluggard's out of shape, of course. Okay, there we go. And the sluggard doesn't shave. Okay, so there's the sluggard. Right there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> but, but it's used as an instrument to, to compare the sluggard with the prudent, uh, the diligent, the hard worker. Now, there's a little bit of a sluggard in every one of us. And you'll see that as we go. So a number of scriptures that are given to us, we'll just tick through them here first. Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Doesn't mean that a sluggard doesn't have desires, they just don't do anything about it. Proverbs 19, verse 24. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but will not even bring it back to his mouth. This, I think this is, there's a little bit of a humor being used here. Moms and dads, remember when your kids would fall asleep on their high chair in the tray? Like face down on the cheese? Like there's a little bit of the sluggard, like puts his hand in the dish and like, Ugh. can't even get it out. Won't even do what's necessary to, to take care of basic needs is the point. Proverbs 20, verse 4. The sluggard does not plow in the autumn, but he'll seek harvest and have nothing. But this goes back to the slack hand, right? Doing your work on time, in season, efficiently. When it's time to plant, there's no work done. And so no wonder there's nothing to harvest at harvest time. Proverbs 21, verse 25. The desire of the, of the sluggard kills him, for his hand refuses to labor. This, this is eventually going to be your undoing, if you're unwilling to work. And 22, verse 13, just one more. There's a lot of these. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets. What is that about? Ridiculous excuses. Well, well, I would go to work, but what if there's a lion out there? I mean, it sounds crazy, but there's there's a little bit of a a, a bite and a humor and a sarcasm here about the, the reasons we come up with, the rationalization and justification for not doing what's needed when it's needed. I think each of us can relate to that in different ways. One of the key passages, and you maybe have heard this one before, and is uh, one, one, one guy told me that his grandmother used to use this phrase all the time, the sluggard and the ant from six, chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. Go to the ant, O sluggard. You should use that, parents, now and then. Consider her ways and be wise without having any chief officer or ruler. So the ant doesn't need to be told what to do, just does it. 
She prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? And then later, through a little sleep, a little slumber, and poverty comes upon you like a thief. There's a lesson here to learn. Again, it doesn't matter what your role is. One more passage, Proverbs 24, verses 30 through 34. This is Solomon saying, I was passing by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. We'll, we'll go back one slide. Stop right there. Um, I, we were on vacation in Tennessee uh, with my whole, my side of the family, mom and dad, and my sisters and their families last, or two weeks ago. And uh, I went for a, a, well, kind of a walk, jog, waddle. Um, <laughs> and in the hills of Tennessee, it's hot and humid. And I went down this road. It was, it, it was definitely a street, but it, there were no street signs, and it was pretty rural, and I was, we were kind of in the middle of nowhere. And uh, one of the signs said, beware of dog. The next sign said, the dog is nice, beware of owner. I'm like, maybe I shouldn't go too much farther down this road. Anyway, we came, came around a bend, and it's beautiful scenery, but there was this house that was just like this. I mean, fall, porch falling apart, dilapidated, weeds as high as I am, really unkempt. Obviously, somebody living there that doesn't take care of deep poverty, but also not taking care of what's there. Right next door, I mean, two acres down, the next little homestead, Exact same street, exact same size house, beautiful little house. Beautiful little lawn, nice little, like a, a pony tied up in this little field with a nice fence. I thought, it was like this weird picture of juxtaposition of two homes in the exact same place, one well cared for, one not. I don't know anything about those families, but Solomon says he passes by this field and there's a lesson there, the next passage. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. God's teaching him something in what he sees. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Doesn't take much. The second law of thermodynamics, you know what that is? Entropy. Things go from order to disorder. Things are moving. You don't have to do much for your house to become in disarray. Is that true? Like you just do nothing and it'll happen. Dust, chaos, messes. It takes work and effort and input, energy input into the system for there to be order. And if we do nothing, things break down. That's happening in the universe. It happens in your home. It happens in your job. It happens in your relationships, in your family, in your marriage. It happens in your relationship with God. Look to the ant, O sluggard. Do what's necessary. Because the drift is toward chaos and destruction and breakdown. These things require work. That's why we just finished a series on Colossians. Uh, and uh, when I was actually in Colossae, the city is in Turkey. Um, and we're, there's not much left of that ancient city. Um, but the word of God and his wisdom still stands for us. Colossians 3, verse 23. The Apostle Paul says this. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. Not for money, not for yourself, but for the Lord. Dorothy Sayers wrote an essay in the, in the post-World War II world. Uh, men were coming back looking for meaningful work. They'd been part of this great effort to conquer evil. They, they'd done, they, they put their lives at risk. They'd been soldiers and brothers in arms. If you've ever seen the, the amazing series, uh, Band of Brothers, that kind of thing. They found significance and, and meaning in this quest they were on, this mission. They come back and they feel uh, there was this great sort of um, disconnect with what, what's, what is the meaning of my work. She wrote an essay called Why Work, studying that, and he has a great quote here. The habit of thinking about work as something one does to make money is so ingrained in us that we can scarcely imagine what a revolutionary change it would be to think about it instead in terms of the work done. Think about that for a minute. Think about your work not in terms of what you earn, what you achieve, what you accomplish, what you take home in your paycheck, or how you advance, but in the work itself. To do so would mean taking the attitude of mind we reserve for our unpaid work, our hobbies, our leisure interests, the things we make and do for pleasure, and making that the standard of all our judgments about things and people. We should ask of an enterprise, not will it pay, but is it good? Of a man, not what does he make, but what is his work worth? Of goods, not can we induce people to buy them, but are they useful things, well made? It goes on, but her point, I think, is, is, is well taken here. How do you think about your work and its value to society, to community, and how it's viewed by God? In our culture, 
Individual fulfillment is the chief cultural value. Personal identity, self-expression, personal fulfillment is the primary value in our culture. And so our culture then takes your work and sort of co-ops it into its value system. And if personal fulfillment is number one, then of course, your title, your role, your paycheck, these things are all part of your personal fulfillment. They become paramount in how you think about your work. But God's wisdom says, actually, interdependent human flourishing is what work is about. Not that you shouldn't be well paid for your work. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not primary. That's not paramount. That's not what it's about. Interdependent human flourishing, not your fulfillment, your identity, your wealth, your income, your title, or your own opportunity. God's about shalom, and he's given us work to do in achieving that. Finally, last, redeem your work. To apply God's wisdom to your work means to use all your talents, gifts, skills, abilities, and energy to bless other people and to glorify God. And you might be thinking, like, what, what does that mean? Does that mean like if I, if I own a, 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 a car dealership, do I have to try to convert every person that comes to buy a car? No. But the way you conduct your business with integrity, honesty, dignity, matters, makes an impact. It's good for the community, honors God, blesses others. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Maybe some of you are thinking, look, my job is hard enough. I can't even get it all done. I can't get it all done at home. I can't get it all done at, at, at my job, at my career. The demands are too high. Things are always breaking down. It's a struggle. My boss is a jerk. My coworkers are idiots. Deadlines seem impossible. Customers are never satisfied. And now you're telling me I gotta like be the super Christian at work? No, that's not the point. The point is see work, including your job, under the umbrella of how God made you. Look at Proverbs 15, verse 19. The way of a sluggard, there he is again, is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. Now, I did not notice this till I read Timothy Keller talking about this. This is one of the few places where the contrast is not between the sluggard and the diligent, but the sluggard and who? The upright. Upright meaning, means just, correct, acceptable. But Psalm 130 verse three tells us, if you kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Nobody. Who's actually upright? And it's not just the sluggard who faces thorns. Didn't, doesn't Genesis tell us that when, the, when sin enters the world, thorns and thistles infest the ground and we all struggle? Everybody faces challenges, obstacles, difficulties in our lives, in our work. So how are we supposed to understand this? The path of the upright is a level highway. Well, who's on that? The New Testament tells us that there's only one truly upright person who's ever lived. And only one who's done his work perfectly. The one who's completed the task that God has given to him to complete without sin, without blemish, without dishonoring God. Only one, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And on his, on his head, when he was on the cross, they placed a crown of what? Thorns as a symbol of the curse. Galatians tells us, Paul says, that he took on the curse of sin for us. For 2 Corinthians chapter five, the apostle Paul says, God made him who knew no sin, the, right, the upright one, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took on the thorns so that we could walk the highway, is the point. Here's the best place, I think, where this puts this together for us in the New Testament is Ephesians two, verses eight through 10. We'll finish with this passage. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works. You can never work enough to accomplish your salvation. That no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I love how Paul puts it here for us. You've been saved by grace through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of works, but his work. Not our works, but his work on the cross. His finished work on the cross. For we are his workmanship. And he created us to do good works. 
So because he did the work of our salvation on the cross, and we're made in his image, his workmanship, then he puts us into the world, not to work to earn our identity or achieve our, like our status or our salvation. That cannot be done. He's done it. But to do the good work he's, he's called us to do. His work, our salvation, we're his workmanship to do the works he's prepared for us in advance. Friends, God has work for you to do. Part of that's in your job. Some of you are approaching retirement. Some of you are retired. You might be retired from your career, but your work is not done. That's not meant to exhaust you. It should excite you. God has work for you to do. He still has something for your energies, talents, gifts, and passions to contribute to society for the good of others and the glory of God. This idea of retiring and doing nothing, that is nowhere in Scripture. We have work to do. As long as he gives us breath and life, he has something for us to do for the good of others and for his glory. And for a season, that's your career. For a season, that's your home and your children. For a season, that's your work at school as a student. It changes what you do, right? But not how we do it, why we do it, or who we do it for. That's our work. I think about this in my own life, right? Someday I'm going to be a, I'm no longer going to be a senior pastor here. Maybe I'll have like one tooth and one marble roll around my head. I'll preach in some small church out of the way somewhere. But I want to be preaching the gospel and do the work that God has given me to do until he calls me home. And he wants the same for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wisdom, which we are just barely grasping and we desperately need in our lives. And thank you that you've made us in your image and given us work to do. Forgive us for seeing our work as drudgery, as necessary evil, or as toil. And forgive us also for seeing our work as our identity as who we are and as what matters most. You matter most, and you've given us work to do for the good of others and for your glory. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, great are your works. You are a great God. And the work of salvation, which we stand in all and receive by grace through faith, is the greatest of all. And we're made in your image and called to do your work. We give you praise and glory. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the name of your great God and use all your gifts, passions, abilities to bless others and to glorify him. Amen. And go in peace.